Okay, well, this is going to be the, the lecture, just a review for the midterm. Um, <clears throat> this is targeted towards spring 21. Um, I don't know if I'll ever use it again, but I might. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, there are things in this document that I'm not going to cover. Uh, so I'll skip around a little bit, so don't let that frustrate you. But I want to focus on the things that are going to be covered on the test. And I will do a review session Thursday night at 9 p.m. Uh, on Zoom. I will do it live. And so uh, that'll be a time for you to ask questions. And I'll kind of go over things on the test. So if I miss something in this lecture, don't worry about it too much. We'll cover it again on Thursday night. Um, uh, it's it's going to be 30 to 50 questions. I think I said 30 in the email, but it might, uh, it might grow to 50. Anyway, we'll see. I'll probably delete some more, but um, whatever. Anyway, no more than 50. Promise that. Um, okay, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about the, the KL25Z and the Freedom Board. Uh, we'll definitely talk about the programmer's model and the M0 plus core. Now, the programmer's model is less important when you're programming in C. It's still important for you to understand it. And since, you, since all of you have at least dealt with uh, the... Uh, the reality of assembly language in Micro 1, uh, it, you should be able to relate this to the KL25Z without any real trouble. Um, and the basic things I want you to know, I'll go over those, but it, not that much really. I want you to talk, know a little bit about what's on the Freedom Board. Basically, the accelerometer, the uh, RGB LED, um, a few things like that, uh, that it does, that it interfaces with the um, it has a separate, separate actually. Uh, it's a, it's an M, M4 core, uh, KL uh, device that uh, that runs the Open SDA interface, so it can talk to the IDE. It, it so it can, uh, uh, so that it can load the software, fl flash the firmware onto onto the KL25Z, and also it also sets up a terminal interface and and a debug interface. And it, it, this other chip, this M4 chip, runs all that. And it's a little bitty chip. Um, you probably... Oh, yeah, I'll pop this out. Let's see. I'll see if I can show that real quick. I, you should... Uh, open this. Uh, let's So if you if we look at it, I'm going to show you real quick here. Uh, I'll just put it in a little inset. So so the, that other chip there's the there's the uh, the M4, and I, I I don't think I can read and see what it is on there. You probably can't either. It does say what it says. What it is. Then. I think it says it's a K. I think it actually says it on there, doesn't it? No. Yeah, K twenty. It's a K twenty. But we should be able to read that. Yeah, an M20 ABC. So it's a K20 is what it is. But it's an M4 chip. All right. All right. Okay, so moving on. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the... Uh, <clears throat> We'll talk a little bit about the tilt, the 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 tilt table, the touch panel, the servo. We'll talk a little bit about the uh, the MCU Expresso IDE. We'll talk a little bit about some C, the operators, how you make a mask, functions, variables, things like that. All right. All right. So I'm not going to talk about uh, NMP channel FETs. We'll, we'll, we will cover those, but we're not. We're going to come back. You've already had some of that probably in Lab One and Two, but um, I want to talk about it as applied to H bridges. And um, but we'll we'll see. All right. 
So the M0 Plus. Um, so the programmer's model, uh, it's, I'd like you to, to remember that although the M0 Plus uh, core from ARM does in fact have a privilege in, uh, un, and, uh, and non, an unprivileged mode that you can implement, they chose not to do that. So we, everything runs in uh, privileged mode. And then, um, and there's only one stack pointer. And you should know a little bit about the condition codes, so we'll go through that. Here are the core registers, and this is really, this is all you need to know. So the thumb two instruction set uh, basically has, uh, the, the programmer's model has 13 general purpose registers, R0 through R13. The, the low eight, zero through seven, are called the low registers, and almost all of the thumb instructions can get to these registers. But the upper five, uh, only a limited number of instructions can get to these upper five, and they're called the high registers. Um, then there is a stack pointer. Again, they could have implemented two of them, but they didn't. They only implemented one. So consequently, everything runs with the same stack pointer. When you implement two, you can let your applications use a stack pointer, and you can let your uh, supervisor or your operating system use the other stack pointer. And that's actually a, uh, that's a very helpful thing to have feature to have if you're gonna write an operating system, but they, they chose not to do that, and that's probably fine, because I don't know how many of these chips are running with RTOSs on them. But you could, you can still have an RTOS, you just don't have this advantage. Then there's a thing called a link register and, a progr and the program counter. The program counter, of course, points to the next instruction, although there's pipelining, so it's always a little, it's a little ahead of the game. And then we have, we have this um, th this program status register, which is really made up of three registers. Uh, so it's a little confusing, but uh, if you if you look at these three uh, here, so so we have this application program status, the interrupt program status, and the execution program status. Now these are really all one 32-bit register. The 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 uh, the status codes are up here in, in bit 31, 30, 29, and 28, and it's the negative bit, the Z bit, the carry bit, and the two's complement overflow V bit. Remember, two's complement is when you have uh, two add ends with the same sign, but you get a sum with a different sign. That obviously can't happen. You can't add uh, you can't add two positive numbers and get a negative, and you can't add two negative numbers and get a positive. So if you do that, you overflowed. If you have a positive and a negative, there's no way you can overflow. Uh, and if you have a positive and a positive and you get a positive, or a negative and a negative and you get a negative, then everything's fine. So that's how this bit works. It the 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 hardware doesn't really know whether you're using unsigned or signed numbers when you do ads. So it'll set the carry bit and it'll set the V bit. And you if you were doing a programming in assembly language, then you have to keep track of this as the programmer. But in a C C knows whether your numbers are signed or unsigned, your integers and your chars uh, are signed or unsigned, so it, it, will, uh, it will take care of this for you. But in assembly language, you, you have to kind of take care of this yourself. And then we have a, um, I guess it's five bits for the exception number that tells you basically what the interrupt number is. And then you have this single bit down here in this execution program status register, which for this chip, it doesn't do anything except uh, s stop execution, and it, it screws everything up, and you have to reset. Uh, and the reason it does that in the higher uh, in the M, the M4, the M5s, the M6s in this line, uh, they run on. They, they, those do have a. This is an active bit here, and when you uh, change it, I think it has to be set for thumb two and cleared for. When you clear it, it switches to an entirely different native instruction set. But since we don't have that second instruction set, uh, it's a bad idea to, to clear this bit. I think it has to be set to one all the time. All right. And that's all there is to it. Uh, so remember that our address space is this memory mapped address space. It is four, uh, it is four gigabytes, two to the 32. And uh, so each one of those locations represents eight bits. But the, the instructions uh, natively will deal with bytes, 
half words, which is two bytes, or four words, which is four bytes, 32 bits. And it'll also do 64 bits uh, uh, moves as well. Uh, when you do, uh, you have limited 64-bit support, but it will do some of that. When you, when you address all four bits at once, I'm sorry, all four bytes at once, what your 32 bits, you have to have it, it has to be aligned on, on an address that's evenly divisible by four. So zero, four, eight, or C, which would be 12. So you, you have to be vital, you have to be correctly word aligned. If you're dealing in half words, you have to be aligned on zero, two, four, six, eight, A, C, E. Yeah, those are the choices. Uh, the odd, any, 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 any address that ends in an even number is acceptable. If you're, but, uh, and then if you're dealing in just eight bit bytes, any address is legal and does, and, and will be aligned correctly. If you try and uh, move four bytes or two bytes and you're not properly aligned, then you will get a, you will get a system error, which will generate a reset. Um, everything's in this address space. And, 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 the, and the address space is in little Indian byte format. We'll show that in a second. Here's how it's divided up. Now, each of these groups of, address, of addresses are 500 megabytes. So 500 megabytes, 1 gig, 1.5, 2 gig, 2.5, 3 gig, 3.5, 4 gig. And the code, your flash memories in this first group. Now notice, that's 500 megabytes of address space. But you only have 128K of flash. So it, it rattles around in this, in this address box, uh, you know, like a, like a BB in a, in a barrel. And then you have your, st your static RAM is in the next group. And, it, and then you have your peripheral RAM in the next group. And then you have, you can have some extra RAM. I don't know if this is in, including a little bit of the write through cache that might be on the chip or how this is working, or if this would be where you could put extra memory if you wanted to uh, add some, uh, you know, some memory somehow. And then we have uh, uh, the, the peripherals are down here. I, I think I said that. And then at the very top, there's some other, um, uh, some various uh, odds and ends in the very, very, very top of the address space. You don't have to know anything about this except just have a general idea that the four gigabyte address space has everything addressable mapped in it someplace. Remember that in the PIC world, we had a Harvard machine that had a separate address space for program and another separate address space uh, for the static uh, random access memory and also for all the peripheral registers. Now on that chip, everything was eight bit bytes. Anyway, that's how that chip was set up. And um, but this one is a von Neumann type where everything's in the same address space. And the other th point to make is that that the I/O is memory mapped, which means all of the GPIO ports and all of the peripheral registers uh, have have their registers and their addresses in this address space. So the same instructions you used to read program memory, to read the static random access memory, or to read peripheral devices will work. You don't have to have special instructions for input output like you do, for instance, on your desktop or laptops, because that's that's how they're set up with the IA32, the IBM type stuff. I, I think Apple uses uh, a more modern chip nowadays. All right. So again, bytes, half words, and words and double words can be moved. Double words have limited support, and the the half words and words have to be properly uh, properly aligned with uh, either an even address for half words or an address divisible by four for the, for for full 32-bit words. This is this is little endian format. In in a in a full word, your low order byte comes first, then the next byte, then the next byte, then the next byte. And so you can line the bytes up end to end, and you can see all through 32 bits like this. This chip could have been implemented in big endian form. It, the 
ARM core allows you to do this, but you have to make that choice uh, at the foundry when you when you're actually or when you're actually creating the chip, and and so from the get go, uh, the this this KL25Zs was set up in little Indian form, and most I think most processors are little Indian. It's really uh, you know it's so confusing when they put the higher order byte in the lower order here, and so you have bits. 24 through 31 here, 16 through 23 here, 8 through 15 here, and 0 through 7 up here. It's very confusing. Within each byte, though, the bits are always organized uh, right to left and low to high order. All right. So uh, this is a subset of the generic ARM instruction set, and they call this they call this a thumb two. It's actually it's, its official name, which I can never remember, and you don't have to remember. But if you write, if you saw it, you should recognize it. And that's A R M V six M thumb two. Easiest just to remember thumb two. And uh, it it has it has mostly sixteen bit instructions, but a few of the instructions there are six that are thirty two bits in size. But no instructions are any bigger than thirty two bits. And the nice thing then, this allows you to have fairly good code density. Um, okay. And everything runs in privilege mode. There, there is no privileged and unprivileged modes. They, they were not implemented. Okay. Uh, it is pretty much, it's, Thumb is not a regular instruction set in the sense that it's not really designed for hand coding. It's really designed for uh, compiler code, you know, basically optimized for code density from C code and uh, not hand coding. So it's missing some instructions it might have had if it was going to let you do hand coding. So they expect you to write your code in C or a higher level language, really the bottom line. Okay, all pointers are 32 bits. Uh, this will, so, this, so these are the data types. And this is the, these are the assembly language instructions. Uh, so in assembly, it does it does let you, uh, I guess, do unsigned or signed, and it knows the difference. Actually, even in assembly, even in assembly, it knows the difference because um, it will uh, sign extend. If you load an 8-bit integer into a 32-bit register, and it's signed, it will sign extend to the upper uh, uh, the upper three bytes. If you load an unsigned, it'll zero extend. Uh, so it fills up the zeros, and there are instructions for packing and unpacking these things from registers. Um, and the 64-bit integers are held across two registers, and it, there's really just limited support for that. All right. Uh, so again, most of the 16-bit instructions can only access the low registers, R0 through R7. A small number of 16-bit instructions can access the high registers. And it's when you do these various conditional branches, you only get plus or minus 256, or minus 256 plus 254 bytes. All right, here are the various instruction types. I'm not going to pimp you on this. Uh, if if uh, it's good to just kind of look through it, but the the writes and reads to memory are called loads and stores. Load loads data from memory into the into the CPU register, the programmer's model registers. Store takes it from those registers and puts it into memory. Um, and there are all sorts of standard data processing instructions like uh, ands, ors. Uh, there are shifts, rotates, shift right, shift left. Uh, there, there is a hardware multiply capability. And there's packing and unpacking instructions. All right. The nested vector interrupt controller, the NVIC. So it it is uh, nested in the sense that it, it assigns priorities, and a low priority interrupt that's running can be interrupted by a higher priority interrupt. It's vectored in that every interrupt goes not to the same address and then has to run a routine to figure out what caused the interrupt and then do that code. It automatically goes to what caused the interrupt. Uh, it goes to that interrupt service routine directly. And then from there, uh, you, you just clear the clear the interrupt flag if necessary, and you process the interrupt. And, and so it's a lot faster 
to service interrupts where you don't have to test a bunch of possible flags to find out what caused it. Um, you can assign four levels of priority to each interrupt. And again, higher priority interrupts can interrupt lower priority interrupts. And one of the nice things about this chip is it has a very predictable latency from when an interrupt occurs to when the, uh, to when the uh, interrupt is actually serviced. And that's because some of the multi-byte instructions uh, don't complete, they just, they just flush and, uh, and then it comes back and it re-executes those instructions that, that, that were gonna move multiple bytes and wouldn't have had time to complete it in a, in a, in a reasonable amount of time. And that, that, so that helps give this predictability, this short latency. Um, what's nice using interrupts is that you don't have to poll to catch an event. And when you're polling, generally you're not getting anything else done. So it's really nice if you can use interrupts and have the main routine doing whatever it wants and then only having cycles stolen when an interrupt occurs and it needs to go out and service that interrupt. It's good for brief events, rare events, or frequency events, and still lets you do other things. Um, okay, uh, on this chip, there, there are lots of different sources of interrupts. There are, I think, 32 different numbers, and that's how big the vector table is. So you can have 32 different unique interrupt service routines. Each one jumped specifically to it based on an interrupt. Um, and some interrupts are kind of generic, like there, there, there might be several things that could cause interrupts, say in the A to D converter. Actually, I don't know that there are. I think whenever you complete a conversion, that, that's, that can set the interrupt. But let's say maybe a, maybe a comparator could have a couple different interrupts in different channels, uh, and, but they all go to the same address for the comparator. Whereas, um, but the nice thing is you know it's the comparator. So you wouldn't have to uh, you wouldn't have to spend a lot of time figuring out what module caused the interrupt. But you may have. But if you had a couple of channels operating, then you might have to figure out which channel. Okay. Um, okay. I'm not going to talk about that too much more. Let's talk about the uh, we'll talk about the freedom board. Um, so the process. Well, we'll talk about the processor just a little bit more. So it's a even though it's a KL 25Z, it's actually an L series device. Our chip is a is this KL25Z128 VLK4. It is an 80-pin low-profile quad flat pack, so it still has pins uh, coming out the sides, but it's fairly low-profile and uh, and it has pins on all four sides, 40, uh, 20 on a side. All right, it does operate at 48 megahertz. And it does have these special single cycle fast I.O. ports. We'll talk about that in a minute. There's uh, two different uh, GPIO port um, addresses and registers. One's called GPIO, A, B, C, D, E. And the other's called F, GPIO, A, B, C, D, E. And the F are the fast ones, so this gives you the single cycle stuff. I haven't ever used those features. Uh, the standard pins are plenty good enough for me. It, so I'm a, always a little confused about how much static RAM it has. Um, maybe I'll pause this and straighten that out. I think it may be 16. Yeah, you can see from this table here in the, the data sheet 3.6.3.1, uh, the, MKL, the MKL25Z128 VLK4 has 16 kilobytes of, of SRAM. And... Um, Yeah, and it's got SRAM L and SRAM U. Yeah. It's a little confusing why it would do that, but anyway, that's how it's set up. They split it over this interface. You don't really need to know this, so. Um, okay, I guess it's just so they can break it down uh, in lower power modes. Okay, uh, let me slip that out and we'll go back to here. All right, and <clears throat> so this should be 16. In fact, let me fix that. I don't know if I can fix it here or not. Yeah, okay. 
so I always, for some reason, I have, I, I got that wrong, and then I've always been a little confused. All right, um, so it does have some really great, uh, very, very low power sleep modes, which it's good for you to know about. Um, and again, it has this, uh, this fancy GPIO stuff for the fast reads and access. They call it the bit manipulation engine. Um, this still does what are called read, modify, writes. So whenever it writes to a peripheral, it first reads the pins and then makes modifies and then writes it back out. This can always cause some confusion. Uh, and sometimes if you've got a pin short or something, you can sometimes get funny results. But that's, that's how most micros do it. Does have a DMA controller? Does have a a, a watchdog timer or a computer operating a cop timer, so to speak? Computer operating properly timer. Um, in it has a big fancy clock module. On our board, there's an eight megahertz external crystal oscillator for the KL25Z, and actually there's another eight megahertz crystal oscillator uh, for the K20 that's on there as well. But uh, anyway. That goes into either a frequency lock loop or a phase lock loop, and you can generate a whole bunch of different clocks from that uh, on a whole bunch of different frequencies. Uh, so, but but uh, 48 megahertz is is the fastest. So you can you can crank it up to 48, and that's actually what it does. I, I, most of the software that, that in MCU Expresso automatically cranks it up to uh, 48 megahertz. The bus clock is sometimes running at half that speed at 24. Um, Okay, so we, we do have um, a 16-bit A to D converter. It's a SAR type su successive approximation register. And it does have direct memory access support, just like the 12-bit DAC does. Uh, there is a high-speed comparator. And the number of channels varies a little bit, but I think, I think we have, I, th I forget. I can't remember if it's 24 channels. I know there's four double-ended channels. We'll see that in a minute anyway. Uh, so there's two uh, uh, SPI ports. There's two I squared C modules. It does support a full USB module, including it'll, it'll provide the five volts. It's got a built-in voltage regulator to do that. And then it has these uh, tick timers and a uh, low power one second timer. Um, it's got uh, obviously a GPI controller and a capacitive touch sense in input interface module. The board itself has this uh, three-axis accelerometer, capacitive touch slider, and an RGB LED. The headers are supposed to be Arduino compatible. They are, they are Arduino space, but remember the Arduino just had single row headers. These are double row. So uh, I think you have to use the inner row for the Arduino, and usually that blocks your outer row, so it causes all sorts of problems. It, it, it really, it was a nice thought, but I've never put a, an Arduino intended shield on, on one of these chips. The other problem is that most of the shields run at 5 volts and this chip runs at 3.3 so that's a bit of a problem too. Although a lot of the newer Arduino chips are running at 3.3 now. So, um, All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the peripherals. Uh, I do want you to know some things about the, the serial per peripherals. I squared C, SPI, UART, USB. We're not going to really talk about USB. We're not going to not going to do use USB. Um, but it, it, is, it is one of the options. Um, okay, so uh, this is a little bit confused on... So the whole approach taken um, by MCU Expresso is to, is to give you the tools to easily configure as much stuff as possible. Now, for our particular chip, it does not give you the automatic tools for configuring your peripheral registers. But... For a lot of the chips and that it supports, it does give that capability too. But what it does do for us, it does allow us to set clocks in the clock module and pins in the pin module. It just doesn't let us do it in the uh, peripheral module. Uh, the peripheral modules uh, uh, are, have not been implemented uh, in the ID uh, in the MCU Expresso. So you still have to, you, you basically, what you basically have to do is find one of the example programs and then uh, basically lift from the example programs whatever you need to uh, to make the module work, and that's basically what I did. Uh, what I did for the uh, for the the tilt table code. Uh, 
it would have been easier for me to have configured at least some of the modules from scratch. Now, some modules are really complicated, and I, I don't think I could have done that. Like the A to D module, really hard to configure from scratch. You really, you really just you need a lot of help with that. And so I started, I started with the, uh, with one of the pre-existing programs that configures the A to D module, and then, uh, then I ported into that the the the, the files that I needed uh, and the configuration I needed for the uh, PWM for the serv to control the servos, and then I modified some of that code a little bit to get better resolution. Uh, on the duty cycle because the way it was written it, it limited your resolution uh, it, it limited the resolution to a percentage which would basically be 0 to 100 uh, and you couldn't do fractional portions because it used integers so you couldn't do you couldn't do 10.5 or 10.25 you could do 9 10 or 11 those are your choices uh, and since we're using a servo we're, we're only a small part of that duty cycle window is useful to us and now that, that gave us very very uh, poor granularity of control over our servos so I think the way it worked out with the uh, with the uh, percentage uh, we we had uh, something like uh, you go from one essentially uh, one millisecond to two milliseconds that's pretty much your range of control maybe a little bit before one, a little bit after two. But roughly, because that's 10%, so 10% of 100 is 10. So that's 10 steps across your, your entire uh, 180 degrees of rotation. You only get 10 choices of position, and that's just not sufficient. So I, I upped it from 100 to 1,000, so it gives us now it gives us 100 points, which is still not great, but uh, it's probably sufficient. We'll see. We may have to change it again. I think the native, the native uh, registers w could give you a lot more because they're the clock is a 16-bit clock, so you, it it goes from one to 65,000, and you get uh, uh, say you get 10% of that. Uh, well, that's 10% of 65,000. Still, that's that's a fair amount. That's it's at least 6,000 different steps. So that's probably more than you need. It's probably probably can't even resolve that many in your actual servo. It's a little clunky. Um, yeah. All right. So here are the steps for setting up a pin, uh, setting up a port. The steps, these are still the same steps that you have to do in MCU Expresso. But in MCU Expresso, if you're using the, the helper code, um, and you're configuring the pin yourself. You just do this in a Google and in, in a GUI interface, and it's all set up for you. It generates it generates the software, and the software is a little different. Um, it does all these things, but it it uses uh, it uses uh, structures and function calls. Uh, so first you have to set the structure up, and then you call a function, and then then it writes the values into the register for you, rather than having you write the values into the register. So, uh, so that does constrain you a little bit, and sometimes you have to do workarounds if it doesn't give you all of the options. Uh, but here are the steps. You first have to turn the clock onto the port, and I covered this in some of the labs. You have to set the pin uh, as GPIO in the multiplexer, and the actual register on the chip is the, is the, uh, is the, the GPIO, say, for port A, pin 18. It would be GPIO A underscore PCR for pin control register 18 and then you write there's a 3-bit field in that that you have to write the 3-bit code and the 3-bit code for GPIO mode is always 001 it's always choice 1 choice 0 which is the default choice is always defaults to an analog function if there is one and if there's no analog function then it uh, uh, then it may not I, I don't know I guess it doesn't default to anything I don't know what it does then Maybe it defaults to GPIO in that case. I don't know. Uh, we can see uh, if we want to look. Let me uh, let me pause it here. Okay, so this is the multiplexing table in Chapter 10, and if you scroll up here, um, yeah, okay, you can see there's no analog function on PTE zero. So the default setting for there's nothing for Alt zero. That's default, so it's just disabled, 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 disabled. And then here you can see 
that's a USB function. That's a voltage out or something. That's a 3.3 out pin. That's a, uh, I don't know, anyway. And here you see the analog functions. Analog to digital converter, uh, zero. Single-ended zero. Uh, the dual-ended positive zero. And then down here is the dual-ended minus zero. Our single-ended 4A and so forth. And um, anyway, so if there's no analog function or some other function like like a software clock uh, or a, the non-maskable interrupt or various things or power inputs or analog power or whatever, then then they're disabled. So that is the deal. Okay. All right. So here is, um, so these are the steps. Four steps, and, and you need to remember these steps. Turn the clock on first. Set the multiplexer setting to setting one for GPIO mode, which, was ne which is never the default setting. They don't ever power up in GPIO mode. You have to set them to GPIO mode. Set the initial output state, either a one or a zero, and set the pin direction. Now, in the GUI window, you first have to set the pin direction to output before it'll let you set the initial state because the initial state on input doesn't mean anything. And then you also have some other choices, pull-ups, uh, pull-downs, uh, and uh, there's a couple of others. Uh, whether it gives you a high drive, a few of the pins are set up for, for sourcing a little more current, and then some of them have these glitch filters that are sort of nice. So they're different things. And the settings may be, uh, they may be grayed out. If we actually look at MCU Expresso, here, I'll do that. Uh, I think I have it up. Oh, okay, well, all right, let me pause it and we'll bring that up. Okay, so here's MCU Expresso. And if you can see up here, I'm in uh, developer mode. If I go into this little icon here, I go into the pin mode. And uh, it comes up with the pins and hopefully it's gonna populate everything. So here's my chip with all the pins on it. And I can, and here's where I select. Now notice you can, uh, like here I have GPIOs, so this is set up for the tilt table. So we're using PTB 8, 9, 10, and 11 for the touch panel. And then we're using analog B0 and B1 um, down here. Uh, let's see, AD, ADC 0, uh, single-ended 13, and ADC 0, single-ended 12, which are actually uh, port B uh, pin 0, and this is port B uh, pin 1, or something like that. Uh, or, no, I take it back. I think it's three, uh, 2 and 3. And then our TPM is, is our, uh, this is our, our PWM output, and it's port B bit 0 for channel 0 and port B pin 1. So we're using port B 0, 1 for the TPM, 2 and 3 for the A to D, and 8, 9, 10, and 11 for the touch panel. And what we do with 8, 9, 10, and 11, we, we, we have uh, two of the lines. So one connects to the left side, one to the back, one to the right side, and one to the front. So when we want to measure an X value, we put the left and we put a voltage across left and right, zero on left, say, and and 3.3 volts on right. And then we, uh, so you can see here we have this setup. Uh, PT8 is logical zero, and PT9 is logical one. So that's left and right. And we gave them names: left, right, back, front. And uh, I don't, I think you can see this. Yeah, barely, maybe. Anyway, this is very nice. And then you can see over here. This is this basically reproduces that table that we see, that table that we see in the uh, in the in the manual. It lists all the pin numbers here, zero through eight, one through eighty, and all the ports, and it and it tells us what the function is. So that's that's really nice, and and you can see it's set up by what modules we have, and we can actually make this a little bigger if we want to pull this over here. But uh, anyway, uh, and this is our chip here. And then you can see uh, these are the pins we're using. So we're using PTB 8, 9, 10, and 11. And we're using, um, let's see, uh, I don't see, there's the UART pins. And 
yeah, ADC zero. Yeah, that's pin 13, but I don't see pin 12. Oh, here it is. Oh, here's ADC 12 and 13 and TPM channel one and zero. So those are those pins. Uh, I don't know what that is. Pin number 13. Oh, port E bit 20. Oh, I think that one was just left accidentally. I probably should turn that one off. Yeah. Yes, this is this is here. So it's it's ADC zero. Um, yeah. So I I don't think I'm actually using this pin. So I probably should I probably should get rid of it. It it was uh, it was there originally. I just never deleted it. All right. So you can see it shows you all the pins you're using, and you can click on something and it'll and like you can click on this and it'll give you all the op, all the pins in that port that you can use and set them up. All right. Okay, so we're not gonna not gonna use any of those. And you can see when you click on them, they turn yellow, and so it's it's really nice. Okay, um, so let me I'm gonna go back to developer mode. Now, if you want to mess with the clock settings, you can go into the clock. So these two are implemented on this chip, and you can you can you can select these clock values. You can change them over here, um, but if you try and go into the peripherals here you'll see that it just says they're not implemented. Uh, peripheral tool does not support selected processor. Sorry. Sorry, Charlie. So, so you have to set the peripherals up yourself. But you have lots of example code, and so you can pick one of these and use that, and that's, that's what I did. Okay, and it only took me all week to do it, but it, it wasn't terrible. Okay. So remember these steps. Even though we don't we don't usually do these absolutely directly now we actually use that GUI interface instead. Okay, uh, so these are some of the other features and you can set them in that same GUI interface. And they're they're not all pins do not implement all of these things. I think all the pins implement pull ups and pull downs, but some of them some of them don't implement slew rates drive rates and uh, and uh, so, and the uh, little filter, noise filter thing, glitch filter or whatever. All right, I did cover timers in one of the lectures. I'm not gonna ask a bunch of questions about them, but uh, you should just, you should at least know the four timers we covered. And um, the, uh, let's see, I think I talked about all this stuff. I'm gonna skip through this. Um, yeah, I, I'll mention open collector. The, the I2C lines are always open collector, and it basically takes a transistor like this or a FET, so that would be open, uh, open drain. And what it does, uh, when, when, the, when, the, uh, tra when the transistor is in cutoff, then this pin is floating. And when it's, when it's turned on, it pulls this pin to ground. So what's, what you can do then, you, this pin connects to the bus and everything connected to the bus is connected with an open collector so that it's either floating or pulled down. And that means you never have any conflict on the bus between, um, between something trying to pull the line high and something else trying to pull it low. Because the only thing that pulls the, the line high, we have one external pull up resistor usually size somewhere between two and five K ohms. And it, it's, it's connected between the line and, uh, and VCC so that it pulls it up to 3.3 volts if the transistor is cut off. But if the transistor is turned on or the FET's turned on, the channel is turned on, then it pulls that, that down to zero. And of course it can, totally, it can easily overcome the 10 K pull up. So that's how that works, and and it, this is a really really nice feature, and it's always used by I squared C, and there are a few other bus protocols that use uh, use it as well. We call this a wired OR because it, it functions as though uh, all of the all of the connections to the bus are going through a common OR gate. 
so they don't ever get in contention with each other. <coughs> okay, um, th this table is out of the uh, pick thing. Uh, remember, there are a lot of fancy uses for GPIO. You can basically mimic most of the mod well, you can mimic most of the digital modules with them. Uh, you can mimic PWM just by setting up a little loop and a, and a counter and controlling it that way. Uh, but your mainline routine would be bogged down doing nothing but that. So it's really nice to have a module that can do this automatically. And once you set it, you can forget it. Um, okay, here are the four timers we covered. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time because we did go over these. Uh, basically, um, so four timers. Let's see... The, the, time, the PWM timer, this is what we're using with our uh, servo. And there, 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 are, uh, there are three different timers, one for each of the TPM channels. And uh, those channels will be configured for capture, compare, and PWM mode. And uh, channels, uh, uh, module zero has six channels. Module one and two just have two channels. So you could actually, in theory, you could have eight uh, PWM signals, but everything in the same module has to be running at the same clock frequency for the, for the overall cycle, for the overall PWM period. The duty cycle can be adjusted by channel. So every channel has its duty cycle register effectively, but the whole channel, uh, all, the whole module, all the channels in that module have to have to be have to be have the same pulse repetition frequency or whatever you want to call it. Um, okay, and then we talked about the periodic interrupt timer, the low power timer, and the real time clock. I'm just going to say a couple things about these. As long as you kind of know a little bit about these, that's fine. There are some other timers and other clocks on the chip, of course, but we're not going to talk about them. Um, so remember that our TPM timer. Uh, comes from either the bus clock, the, either the system clock or the bus clock divided by, or the system clock divided by two, and uh, you can prescale it by by one, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, one twenty-eight. It uses a sixteen-bit counter, so so you can see it with a sixteen-bit counter. It's going to count up from zero to sixty-five k, two to the sixteenth. Uh, it can do up or up down. When you when you use your uh, PWM in center aligned mode, then you you do have uh, you you will use it in up down mode. And since for any channel for any module, if if you're doing if any channel is center aligned, all the channels have to be center aligned, or they're all going to at least use an up down counter. All right. So again, uh, channel zero has six channels. I'm oh, sorry, module zero has six channels, or TPM zero has six channels. TPM one has two. TPM two has one. I uh, mean, has two also. Sorry, that was confusing. TPM zero has six channels. TPM one has two channels. TPM two has two channels. And again, the duty cycles could be different, but if a module is operating in center line mode, or with an up-down counter, all of the modules have to operate with that up-down counter in center line mode. All right, and you can do capture on rising, falling, or both edges. You can do compare. Uh, you can have the compare can have the signal set, cleared, pulse, toggled, on match or whatever. And then your PWM, it's either you can have edge aligned or center aligned modes. You can also generate a DMA request or interrupts from these channels. Um, and yeah, and there are a number of different triggers that can trigger various features. The periodic interrupt timer, basically, um, it can be used to trigger DMA channels, to raise interrupts, to mask interrupt, uh, maskable interrupts, and also independent timeout periods for each timer. Uh, this is a strictly internal timer, has no external pins. Uh, but you can you can use it internally for a number of different things, and you can you can chain two timers together and get a 64-bit forever timer. Well, two to the 64th, uh, a 32-bit one-second timer K 
can run for 136 years, I think I calculated. So you can imagine what 2 to the 64th will do. Because, huh. yeah. It can do a lot of counting before it's going to overflow. Uh, so these timers can generate uh, triggers, interrupts, and various things at various periodic intervals. All right. We have a low power timer as well. And um, so, so this can be used for different things. Um, and it can be used to count input pulses. It can be a free running counter. It can be up or down or up down. And the low power timer will run in all sleep modes. Run, wait, stop, low leakage, and debug. So it's, it's a really good way to wake your chip up from deep sleep if you're doing that uh, on periodic intervals. Um, okay, I think that's all I'm going to say. The real-time clock, 32 bits. It can go for 136 years uh, if it ticks one second for, per tick. Um, and it will actually tell you if it overflowed, but it's not likely to do that in any reasonable amount of time because it, if you start at zero, it's going to count up to 136 years. Um, that's a lot of counting. It does have a 16-bit prescaler, and it, can, and, it, and it has a compensation to adjust your, your frequency by as little as 12.12 parts per million or as many as almost uh, 4,000 parts per million. So you can see you should be able to fine tune that sucker so it's really right on target. Once you initialize this register, you can, you can do write protection and you have to do a power on, re power on reset to uh, enable ac write accesses and it'll crank out this one hertz square wave. All right. Um, so yeah, there's lots of... Uh, Lots of lots of uh, um, real time registers here. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get into that. And I, um, yeah, it runs on this internal 32.768 uh, crystal, uh, which uh, you can you can adjust a little bit because there it has cap tunable capacitors that can be modified by software by up to almost 4,000 parts per million down to as little as 0.12 parts per million. And then you can use the lock register to prevent any additional accesses until you have another power on reset. All right, E A to D. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time. I think I have talked about this. It's uh, it's up of up to four pairs of differential and up to 24 single-ended analog inputs. And the differential can operate in 16-bit, 13-bit, 11-bit, or 9-bit modes. The single-ended which we're using for our tilt table, can be 16-bit, 12-bit, 10-bit, and 8-bit modes. The, the differential uses a pair of inputs, and this is a good way to get rid of, of common mode noise. The, uh, the single-ended just have a single input, and it's referenced to ground, of course. If you're using a differential, then your, your result will be a 16-bit two's complement number that's sine extended. If, on the other hand, you're doing uh, single-ended, yeah, that's for uh, sign for differential modes. If you're, if on the other hand you're doing uh, single-ended, then uh, the output's just unsigned, right justified, 16-bit uh, value, which will be, of course, in a 32-bit register, it'll be zero extended. But the modules register, uh, the upper, I don't think the upper 16 bits are implemented. Uh, you can have it do one conversion and then wait until you start it again, or you can have it set up to do do a conversion, generate a set the interrupt flag, and maybe maybe generate an interrupt or maybe not depending, and then uh, immediately do another conversion and eventually overwrite the uh, the register with the new value if you didn't read it in the meantime. Um, okay, I'm not going to talk about this. Remember, generally your signal must be between ground and 3.3 volts. You can narrow that range with external references if you want, or even internal references, but you can't, but you can't expand that range. And this is a module. I'm not going to go over this too much. 
I did talk in micro one, I did talk about the successive approximation approach to doing this, and that's how this one works. Okay, um, I think that's it. Oh, it does have hardware averaging, and uh, it also has built in thresholding. And so those are really nice features. You can you can be reading a, a, an external value and you can set a threshold and until it goes over that threshold or drops below that threshold, it never generates an interrupt. But if it does go through that threshold, then boom, it'll generate an interrupt. And you can compare it to the threshold by uh, reading in a single value or averaging four reads, eight reads, 16 reads, or 32 reads, <coughs> which is really nice. This is all done in hardware. You don't have to do a line of mainline code to implement this. It's great. Um, okay, and you can also, it has a built-in internal temperature sensor, which you can read in one of the A to D channels if you choose to do that. Okay, I squared C, SBI, and UR. These are our standard serial protocols along with USB. Uh, I, USB is fairly advanced, and I'm, I, I haven't really gotten into it. Uh, this chip does support it totally, but uh, we typically don't use it, although uh, since we have a, uh, a, a demonstration program, we probably could implement it and get it to work and be real happy with it. But uh, I haven't done that yet. Maybe I will s soon. So these are the three I want to talk about. And, and you should know the features of these three protocols. And I think with this, I'm probably going to quit. Um, okay, so, so these are all considered serial. So is USB. I squared C has two lines. In I squared C, let's see if we go, yeah, and it stands for inner integrated circuit communication, serial communications. So inter integrated is the II, and they abbreviated I2 because it's I squared. So IIC. Uh, I think somebody, Pat, uh, somebody's trademarked the I2C, the I squared C moniker. So some people just do, you know, IIC instead. Or maybe they didn't, I don't know. Uh, anyway, you can run this in master mode or slave mode. So there has to be one master, but there can be a lot of slaves. There, there is such a thing as 10-bit addresses, but I've never seen a 10-bit address. But, the, but mo almost all of the I2C devices I've seen are 7-bit addresses. And what you do is you take the 7 bits and you add one more bit, the, and you make that the, the zero bit, the low order bit, so you shift the seven bits to the left, and then you take the lower bit, and you set it to a, to a one if you're going to write, and a zero if you're going to read, or maybe vice versa. But anyway, that last bit indicates whether it's a write or read. I think it is one for write, zero for read. Uh, and as long as you have, as long as you have every slave has a different seven bit address, then you can have, in theory, up to 127 of these devices connected on the bus. Now, that's turns out that's a lot of capacitance on the bus. It doesn't really work that well. So, usually you you get start getting into trouble once you get a whole, you know, 20 or 30 of these hooked up. You, you might want to use a net use a second I squared C module. Um yeah, you can mask interrupts on this. There's a thing called clock stretching where if a, there's a slow peripheral, it can hold the clock line low to let the master know, hey, uh, I'm having trouble out here. You need to slow down. And that's uh, and that takes advantage of this uh, uh, this open collector bus because when the slave pulls it down, the master releases it and expects it to go high because the pull-up resistor is on the line. But if it's being pulled low by a slave through a, through a you know through a uh, through a bipolar transistor or a FET, then it's it's pulled down pretty hard to ground, and that 10K resistor is not going to, or that 5K or 4K or 3K resistor is not going to pull it up. So, uh, so, so this is a way for the peripheral to to just effectively take control of the clock and slow it down, and the master just waits until the clock floats high, and then it goes on to the next thing, or pulls high. All right, that was a little confusing but just remember this it has this clock stretching capability and in theory you can have more than one master but I, I don't think people implement that much um, all right and here's how it works out you have 
the SCL connects to SCL, SDA connects to SDA, and both the lines have a pull-up resistor on them. We put the pull-up resistor on your Viva board. Some slaves have it built in, so you have to notice if, if you're trying to use a slave with, that's built in, then you may have to deactivate the pull-up on the slave, or you could, you could unsolder them on your Viva board if you were going to use it that way for a long time. Sometimes you can just get by with two pull-ups. Uh, if you're using 4K, it just drops it to two, and that's an acceptable pull-up value anyway. But if you're using, you know, 2K and it drops it to 1K, that eh, might start to get a little, might might begin to be get difficult for the uh, for the open collectors to to pull the line down fast enough. All right, and uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Uh, there's a lot of nomenclature. I'm not going to go through all this. Uh, I, I'm not going to talk about this much, but there is a there are two special conditions. Normally, you only allow uh, the data line to change when the clock line is low. So this tracing is the data line. This tracing is the clock line. When the clock line is low, then you can change the data line. And then when the clock goes high, you have to stop changing the data line, and you let then you let either the master reads the data or the slave reads the data or whatever. The two exceptions to this are when the clock is high, the if the uh, the if the data line is pulled low while the clock is high, that's a start condition. And if the data line is being held low and is allowed to float is allowed to get pulled up high, then when the clock line is high, that's a stop condition. So you so the typical flow is you issue a start condition, then you send out the slave address with the appended read or write bit. And then, then you uh, send down another start condition, which is called a restart, but it's the same thing. Down here, restart, same exact thing. And then you, uh, and then you read uh, the typically eight bits of data in. And then there's an acknowledge at the end of that. There's a, what's called a NAC bit where it acknowledges whether it got the data correctly or not. All right, um, so SPI is a little different. Um, and usually what we do is we use I squared C for slow stuff, SPI for fast stuff. SPI is more complicated because it has, uh, it has a serial data out and a serial data in line, and it has a clock that's a separate line, and it has a slave select line. So, so for one slave, it takes four lines, plus power and ground, obviously, whereas the I squared C takes two lines, plus power and ground, for a, a typical slave, and you can have a lot of different slaves. In SBI, you can have more than one slave, but in the classic use, you have to you have to have uh, a separate slave select line for each additional slave that you add. So for two slaves, you have to have five lines. For three slaves, six lines, and so forth. But there are ways of working around that. You can daisy chain them together but then it takes more time to send the information out. But the nice thing about SPI protocol is it can run fast, uh, much, much, much faster than the uh, I squared C. I squared C is limited to about 400 kilohertz, and the SPI can go into megahertz ranges, you know, 20, 30, 40 megahertz, or maybe higher, depending. And uh, the only thing confusing about SPI is it has four different modes. And the four different modes are uh, based on uh, whether the clock idles high or low and whether the data, data is latched on the falling or rising edge. And that has driven me crazy. And I had one device I bought I never could interface because I, I, I guess because I never could get the right mode set up. All right. Um, the... One nice feature about SPI is it, it is this it is bidirectional. I think I've got some slides here. Yeah. So here's your master, here's your slave. And we we sometimes call this serial data in, and this would be serial data out. But we also can call it MISO, which stands for master in, slave out, and MOSI, which is master out, slave in. Now the nice thing about MISO and MOSI. Uh, I wish they all used this nomenclature, but it, apparently this is copywritten, and so a lot of the companies avoid it. But but if you uh, 
if if you have your device, your if your masters is labeled Miso and Mosey, and your slave is labeled Miso and Mosey, then you you just connect Miso to Miso and Mosey to Mosey, and clock to clock and slave select to slave select. Now here there's no slave select line. The slave select is permanently grounded, so this slave is always uh, talking to the bus and uh, driving its uh, its master in slave out. It's Miso line. But uh, if you had another slave, you would have to put the, you'd have to try state the this output so that it so that it wasn't driving the meso line, and, and to do that, then you just let the slave select go high. You'd pull it high or set it high, and that would that would shut this chip this out the meso output down, so it wouldn't be a problem. Probably tri states everything, so there's no impedance drag on these other lines. All right, so over here we have the master generating the clock with its baud rate and it shares its clock directly through a line with the slave. And then the master out slave in is connected to master out slave in on the slave and the master in slave out on the slave is connected to the master in slave out on the, on the master. And when you clock eight times you always are clocking the eight bits in this shift register into this shift register and the eight bits in this shift register out and into this shift. So you basically exchange 8-bit values. So it is full duplex in that sense, but it's synchronous full duplex. So the slave, if it wants to send out 8 bits, it's, it, it, ha it can only do it when the master tells it to do it, and the master is shifting out 8 bits into the slave at the same time the slave is shifting 8 bits out into the master. Here's where you can daisy chain them. Well, this is, here you have a separate slave select. PPO1, 0, PPO1, PPOK for the kth slave. But here you can daisy chain them. So you, you don't even have slave select. They're always on, and you just clock the information. Uh, and most of these chips are implemented so you can do this. Uh, implemented in a way that allows you to do this. But uh, to get 8 bits all the way to slave K, you have to shift out 8 bits then another 8 bits, and then another 8 bits, and you'll have 8 bits here. And to get 8 bits from slave 0 back into um, MISO, you have to shift it first into slave 1, then into slave K, and then back into MISO. So, so it's a little bit contentious, but you don't. You, this will minimize the number of additional lines if you have multiple uh, slaves. All right. Uh, I think I'm going to talk about... Uh, I'm not going to talk about the camera. This is a line scan camera. There, there's the actual sensor. We put a lens over this, and then we read it with the A to D converter, essentially. Um, not going to do this. Servo, I just wanted to say a little bit about servos, and I think I'll quit with this. So here's your servo. Uh, it consists of a fairly inexpensive motor that runs a gearbox, and then it has a shaft encoder here, a position encoder, usually a pot, a linear pot, and as the shaft turns, the pot turns along with it, and the pot tells tells the electronics on the servo uh, where the shaft is, and it sends that information then down to this air amp. You also have a control pulse, that's your PWM signal that comes in, and that PWM signal gets converted to a voltage that goes into the air amp. So you have a voltage from the pot, that is your position sensor, and a voltage from your control pulse, and these should be exactly equal if the potential, if the pot, if the servo is in the right location, and so you play around with it and play around with it, and and you can, whenever you change the control pulse, then it forces the motor to run forward or backward through the gearbox and null out this position sensor so that it now reads zero. And generally speaking, our 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 pulse repetition period here is 20 milliseconds. But the useful part of our signal is something like minus one point, uh, well, it's something like point, yeah, it, it's, it's something a little less than one. So 0.7 milliseconds to maybe something a little more than two, maybe 2.1, 2.2, 2.3. And so when, when you're at, uh, when your signal is at, say, a nominal value of, of uh, 
one millisecond, it should be full clockwise. When it's a nominal value of two milliseconds, it should be counterclockwise. More than two milliseconds, it should just stay clockwise. It may be making your servo hum or chatter. It may even heat it up eventually. So you probably don't want to exceed that two very much. But I've found that sometimes you have to go to 2.1, 2.2, 2.3 milliseconds to get a full counterclockwise rotation to give you that full 180 degrees. On our tilt table, we won't, we don't really need that much because it, as once you get past about you know, 45 degrees, it starts to get, or maybe even 30 degrees, it starts to get a little bit non-linear. And uh, so, anyway. And then, if you make your pulse real short, something between 0.7 and 1 millisecond, you get this full clockwise motion. And then the operating room is, the, the operating, uh, the mid position, I should say, center position, the, your, your pulse is up for 1.5 milliseconds. Now, uh, yeah, so, so the reason why, notice we're only using our maximum signal is just two milliseconds out of this 20 millisecond period. Now I'm, I'm running ours at 10 milliseconds because it turns out even though servos are supposed to have a 20 millisecond pulse repetition period, they still work generally just perfectly fine with a 10 millisecond pulse repetition period. And if you do the 10 millisecond pulse repetition period, again, that gives you much better granularity of your uh, duty cycle. Uh, <clears throat> so um, you also update your servo position every 10 milliseconds instead of every 20. So you get a little bit faster response. Although there's still a mechanical delay. Okay, I'm not going to talk about H bridges and I think I think I'm going to quit with this. Yeah. I'm not going to talk about we may we probably won't do the LCD display, hopefully. And the accelerometer. Here's what that looks like. It's the MMA 84, uh, uh, 84, uh, 84, uh, sorry, 845XQ. And it's a, it, it has an I2C interface. It's three axes, 14 bits per channel. And you can select the range from plus or minus 2, 4, or 8G. And you can get some pretty fast data rates. You can get it update. The slowest is about 1.56, and you can get it as fast as 800 times a second to update. And these are these are used in a lot of stuff now. Of course, every cell phone's got one, so you can turn it sideways or vertical, and your pictures will roll around. And so that just uses an accelerometer, but there are all sorts of other cool uses for them as well, like to stabilize a, a handheld uh, photographic. Uh, uh, shoot, it'll it'll wait to it'll put a little delay in the trigger until it senses that everything's stable, and um, so that's a nice feature. You can also sh ship one of these in a little circuit, and uh, when your package gets there, you can you can download a history of uh, of any bad shocks or or drops or anything like that, and get a sense of how many G's it it registered and in what axis. Lots of cool things you can do with it. All right, um, have to remember the chip is oriented like this. All right. Okay. Um, all right, I think I've covered everything I wanna cover. I'm gonna stop uh, the recording here and um, then I will I was going to talk about uh, calibrating your touch panel using MATLAB. I will cover that in a separate video later this week.